Today we are going to look at uh, an essay by Aldous Huxley called Banaras. Banaras can be uh, classified as a travel essay or a, it comes under the genre of travel writing where basically what we see in travel writing is how um, there is not just uh, travel writing is not just about a person going uh, going to a new place visiting a new place um, encountering a different kind of world and then writing about it but when we actually encounter something new in our lives we actually take our old baggage or all our, all our cultural baggage all our uh, cultural background with us we take our world view with us to this new world and experience it and use the old world or the knowledge that we already we have about uh, life as a frame of reference to understand what we are encountering new so when um, when we if we have to approach this text banaras as such a kind of an experience by aldous huxley who is with a group of um, uh, tourists who went to this um, sacred famous city banaras to uh, see something okay so, uh, so he it actually talks about an eclipse eclipse that happens uh, and there are many like uh, over a million people gathered over there um, all religious people uh, in hopes of getting some kind of blessings from this great event what we have here is an eclipse that um that all this uh, religious hindus have actually gathered to experience and make their ritual um, uh, ritual observances and worship okay so he describes this colorful scene of all these people gathering so when we read this essay we are supposed to uh, supposed to look at it on two levels on one level all these people have been gathered in that city this holy city for a religious purpose or a spiritual purpose and they um, they have come to see the eclipse but our author our huxley reminds us that what he has come there here um to this city is to actually observe the hindus and their ritual uh, observances so what is a spectacle to the people is uh, the eclipse itself which uh, the author reminds us that it's not even uh, perceptible as in it was uh, not a full eclipse over there he 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 points to the fact that the whole uh, the complete eclipse actually was visible in sumatra but here it was just a sliver and that um, that actually draws all these crowds and the spectacle for our author is not uh, not the eclipse itself but the people who have gathered there for this purpose for this religious purpose so here we have to actually when we think about travel writing as like a meeting of two worlds not just of individual encountering um, worlds we have to think about the author's perspective and the people who have gathered over there with, with their religious perspective the people who have gathered there are from um, think that this is a very uh, auspicious time or inauspicious time because of its a, um, it's an eclipse and they have uh, actually come to make all these ritual observances to secure some good future or uh, uh, have some kind of spiritual benefit out of it uh, and he actually uh, points to this as in he says that he lacks the eye of faith to experience what they experience in that moment as in this eye of faith he refers to as this eastern view point this kind of mystical spiritual kind of view point that he thinks as a westerner he lacks to actually experience the eclipse um, in this manner but the but we have to think about the other side too what kind of perspective is he coming from he is coming from the western rationalistic point of view when an eclipse is just a celestial event that's it nothing more than that but when it comes to uh, comes to the religious point of view eclipse m- uh, means more than that 
So there is a actually a dichotomy um, actually that runs throughout this essay of this rational point of view versus the superstition or um, spiritual kind of point of view. So, uh, so for the Hindus who have gathered there, and he, he describes all the people that are gathered there of how um, there are women carrying children, there are all these people have walked for miles to get there. Uh, for, uh, it, it's like a big pilgrimage um, a, a area that uh, the, the river bank was. So all these people who have gar- walked to the guards, carrying food, settle, settling down over there on the way, on the roads, on the dusty roads. And all of this clamor, all of these um, um, crowds that have been gra- gathered have, are for, for the purpose of this one uh, simple event of an eclipse that he didn't find that uh, that important um, uh, from his perspective. So he actually re- describes it as, uh, he tries to, makes an attempt to actually understand it from their per- perspective by referring to the myth, uh, myth of um, Ketu devouring the sun. As in, he describes that for Hindus, it is... Um, you know, for, for believers, it's actually a serpent actually devouring the sun, and their observances are actually um, getting them getting them something out of it. Uh, so here, for what for him is just like a rational, um, simplistic sort of you know, simplistic sort of celestial event. For them, it is a war between light and dark. Of some um, uh, some kind of serpent devouring um, the sun, and then um, then the sun getting back its life, as in it's a, it's a it's a war or like a battle between good and evil in a sense, in a symbolic sense. So this view, this view of uh, viewing the eclipse as something more than just a celestial element is not exclusive to uh, Indians. We have this in many cultures. Uh, If you look at the Chinese, any sort of uh, solar eclipse would would mean that there is some kind of uh, ominous thing is going to happen politically in the nation, right? So the same uh, same is true for the ancient Greeks who believed that um, the, uh, the king was going to die if there was an eclipse. So they had this strange little practice where they used to replace the king with a um, new person, enthrone him symbolically, and later um, later kill him, um, kill him after the day of the eclipse. So many cultures have such kind of beliefs where they, they where they view uh, something like uh, something like uh, something like an eclipse as something which uh, with a lot of um, uh, value and symbol. Uh, spiritual value or something which uh, meant something ominous was going to happen. So as he watched all those people over there in uh, in Benares watching all the pilgrims do their ritual observances, his eye ca- catches something interesting now. He looks and beholds like a, uh, a princess being escorted. As in, back in those days, when anyone from the royal uh, households used to, used to be highly protected. So he sees this colorful scene when a beautiful palanquin is brought for the princess to get in. So he sees this interesting spectacle. He sees a princess being brought and he gives a good little description about what happens there. So the princess is brought with all curtains she is uh, with colorful scarlet curtains and uh, her way to the barge so she is uh, instead of bathing he, we are informed that instead of bathing with the other people the princess is actually led into a barge with the palanquin with the attendants or like servants uh, um, uh, ser- servants carrying that palanquin so he, uh, she gets into the palanquin un- uh, unnoticed by the others because everything is covered by scarlet curtains and uh, her way is actually um, uh, made by like uh, uh, 
putting cloths on on the ground and uh, clothes in the ground and she is carefully taken without uh, without the gaze of uh, strangers falling upon her and she and her attendants and she and her female attendants actually get in there and enter the barge and it's interesting what uh, huxley says when watching all of this for him this is like a strange spectacle he describes the prin- princesses as poor princesses he say, he used the adjective poor he f- it's almost as if he's like um, feeling a sort of a sympathy for them and he describes her as a prison person as in because of all this ritual and um, a sort of um, a sort of bifurcation or um, between male and female as in because she's from the royal class she uh, no um, no strange men are supposed to actually even uh, look at her so she is all covered up so she uh, she's taken in a very careful way uh, uh, like this and he sees all of this and feels that it is quite strange that um, this uh, all of this has happened and he feels um, uh, sy- sympathy for this uh, uh, princess in his description in his description of uh, the uh, ancient barge as uh, as like a big boat a barge is a big boat um, which the princess is actually going to enter he describes and compares it to the noah's ark so again the kind of um, uh, remember what i told you about using your own, um, your own culture as a frame of reference to understand a different culture so that is what is at work uh, here he compares noah's ark which is from his own culture and co- um, to the barge that the princess enters and he feels sorry for this princess whose uh, whose life is all secluded because of the ritual and the pomp and the you know, and, you know regulations the regal protocol that actually exist around her life and this actually falls under the uh, stereotype of uh, the colonizers when the western man or like the uh, western white man came here to colonize uh, these lands the, these eastern lands the only one um, area or like one place that they could not have access to is the space of women as in uh, which was actually known as the zanana as in this space of women was always out of mainly from the upper classes or the um, uh, royal classes this space was not accessible to the western uh, man so there is a lot of fascination you see in many sort of uh, sorts of um, texts uh, which describe this space as something strange and mysterious as in uh, one thing is like the, there is a sort of exoticization of uh, in uh, eastern women of how they um, they are mysterious people uh, mysterious characters behind the uh, behind the curtains acting or uh, there was always a, a sort of you know mystique uh, around this uh, sort of um, uh, sort of phenomenon of uh, how they were co- covered up and all. so uh, he exp- he actually describes it in this manner as in uh, the uh, and uh, what how how does he talk about the um, water itself he talks that uh, he actually describes it in very interesting words he calls it the sacred stream that is filthy and for them that is sacred for indians that stream or the ganges the water um, uh, water there is sacred but for him it is filthy and he says that it's stagnating in darkness so he feels sorry for her that she uh, the princess has to actually go into the barge and uh, bathe in those stagnating water inside the inside the barge um, that is uh, that has been collected for her and and not um, uh, not like the rest of um, other indians or like other lower classes or um, people who are not that privileged in india who are bathing in the open outside and he calls the water uh, dirty so there is this contrast between how he is viewing things and how um how the indians or the hindus are actually viewing the same things and experiencing the same things now as they go along 
their attention is caught by what they see next they see uh, on the steps on the ghats bodies burning they they see all these uh, dead bodies being burned in in a ritual fashion and people just walking about as in uh, it's a na almost natural thing in the in that place so here um, he describes he uses words like gruesome and grotesque for what he sees of human flesh burning and this uh, this actually i think his description of uh, bodies burning over there on the banks actually uh, tells us about how death is viewed in these two um, uh, two world views on the one hand we have the east which has a very cyclical um, cyclical sort of uh, um, view about death as in death is a part of a, a part of the whole reality and it's swallowed up by life and so on but when we look at the uh, western view or like the rational sort of a post enlightenment view of uh, um, death it's always something to be avoided always something um, which which is out there that most people do not think about but here he is met with a culture where death is treated as part of everything it's like a, um, it was so, uh, so so part of the reality that um, uh, everyday everyday reality um, that is not like put aside or um, treated as something so negative that it should not be uh, in view of others or it should be covered up and put somewhere in a, uh, compartmentalized in a certain way which only uh, denotes grief and all so here he sees this open display open display of uh, um, bodies burning and people just beside the uh, beside that like just doing their ritual observances going on about like uh, in their uh, daily routine he sees that as very strange then they move on from this grotesque scene and they they are met with uh, uh, these men around uh, sitting calmly and meditating with all this clamor and all the people going around so he sees the calmness or the uh, the kind of um, unbothered way they are just sitting there uh, bothered by nothing around them and meditating and he actually uh, actually mentions that this mystic method or the technique of meditation has been suggested by krishna in the bhagavad gita so from this we know that he is not just a tourist who is actually looking at a strange world without any prior knowledge of the culture he is going to encounter so as a, as a good tourist he has done his reading about indian philosophy or indian uh, texts religious texts in order to better understand so there is like a, um, a certain desire in him to actually understand this culture this um, this view of uh, life so um, he describes that this simple technique has not been changed and many people follow this method of med meditation and he describes it in a very uh, strange sort of ma uh, manner he he calls it self hypnotism and he calls them nose gazers so in a way there is not like complete acceptance of this practice he's he thinks that it's sort of a self hypnotism or like some kind of uh, they are doing this for some sort of um, mystic sort of um, ecstasy um, so he he actually this actually indicates that how later on in his own life he has gone on to um, adopt perennialism and uh, use a lot of philosophy from vedanta in his own work um, being a philosopher he has borrowed a lot from the eastern texts to actually um, that goes into his work even in his fictional work actually is um, like um, like the book brave the brave new world Actually, um, even even that has elements of um, eastern philosophy coming in there so um, so 
he actually looks at all of this and he looks more and more like people coming in there throngs of people coming in and the police controlling the crowd and uh, and taking their holy dips in that uh, in the water in the right moment when uh, when the eclipse has happened and looks at all these uh, millions of people doing all of this he looks at everything uh, looks at everything and he makes a profound statement which sums up the way the culture shock that he experiences when he is he is going through this he 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 says west is west that statement that small sentence says a lot i think he's in part quoting um, quoting kipling here uh, in in kipling's poem he uh, it, it go it, the saying goes this way the east is east west is west and never the twain shall meet so this kind of sentiment i think is very strong when um, when huxley makes this uh, statement west is west so he actually is drawing a stark difference between the culture he is used to the west from the east where religion is so important so a uh, part of um, the fabric of the life that indians live as opposed to the west where it's uh, just like a, uh, just like a part of their life and it doesn't like uh, define them in the such ways there wouldn't be such crowds um, on a because of religion the uh, reason being religion now that they are in the uh, on a boat watching all of this they go um, uh, they go for their own they look at the all the people performing rituals ceremonies doing their ceremonies watch the holy men meditating and they have already seen the princess get off um, get off and go into the barge in a palanquin being taken by all these people they have seen all of this and then they feel they begin to feel the indian heat on the barge the sun uh, is getting too hot so they get off the get off the boat and venture into the streets of that city that ancient city that narrow streets and narrow lanes they and they see something very interesting uh, uh, a nice uh, very interesting thing that happens and um, even more interesting is the com- commentary that uh, huxley gives on this uh, um, thing that happens so there is this um, there are many beggars lined up with their bowls in front of them waiting for people to drop some few grains of rice into their bowls so that they could get their uh, their daily food of um, that daily bread that way uh, by begging so he describes them as holy beggars and how how beggars are uh, seen as something holy in india and he describes the scene of this one holy beggar one of them sitting and dozing off so this guy is actually sitting there and sleeping and uh, and a bull over there which huxley reminds of is a hindu totem as in um, a totem is an animal uh, for any tribe or group of people which is very sacred uh, seen as something sacred and emblematic to that culture so he he says that a bull walks by um, walks over to the um, walks over to the beggar and while he is dozing off it uh, bends down and eats up all his um, uh, all the rice that has been collected in his beggar's bowl so looking at this scene he actually thinks the uh, actually actually comments that animals sometimes are more rational more intelligent they prove to be more sensible than humans so now uh, uh, remember he does, this is not the first time in the essay that he makes a comparison between animals and humans even when he looks at the holy um, uh, sadhus or the people who were meditating he compares them to cormorants the, uh, the uh, particular type of sea birds so uh, he says that animals are uh, have more sense than him, uh, than humans they do what is necessary for the moment as in they feel hungry they eat they feel thirsty they drink and they need something or they need to go somewhere they do that 
so they they do what is necessary only humans he says are uh, who have been gifted with the uh, or who have the uh, have the ability to reason have the ability to imagine come up with all sorts of explanations about the natural world which are exotic and um, out, uh, extraordinary who his, he asks who would actually uh, look at an eclipse or look at an eclipse and conclude that uh, if any sort of ritual observance is made here on earth for uh, for some for a star that is 9 90 million uh, uh, 90 million uh, miles away uh, that uh, we are in some way helping the uh, helping the sun to get over so he actually says that he makes the point that being this way as in you know, having a religious mindset has actually hurt, hurt india and it has made imbeciles he uses strong language he he calls it silly he calls it stupid he uses the word imbeciles and this whole um, uh, whole ritualistic kind of uh, uh, kind of behavior that he sees around him he calls it an imbecile superstition so all of this actually comes uh, comes from a world comes from an experience of contrasting his world which uh, which he believes is more rational than uh, the world that he is um, encountering and critiquing 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 it based upon his experience uh, based upon this uh, standard and he says that you know we uh, all these magical formula ceremonies that people are doing to actually save the sun uh, what if the same kind of energy is put into saving the sun uh, saving india they and they have all, if all of them have come here to observe um, ceremonies and do all these rituals to actually save the sun or participate in this um, mythical sort of um, um, battle between evil and uh, good and evil and uh, what if all of this energy is into uh, is directed into political channels and uh, political channels india would be liberated he says india would be transformed if the same kind of energy was uh, was put into some useful um, useful work mm, so this uh, this actually goes uh, falls we, uh, i think we should understand this in the sense that the there is a big uh, stereotype the usual stereotype of um, uh, any uh, that comes from the colonial um, times of looking at india or like any kind of complex problems that any nation has which has been colonized looking at that and offering a simplistic sort of solution to anything mm-hmm. so in his um, uh, in his case he suggests that india in religion is a religion is a um, um luxury that india can't afford religion is a luxury that india can't afford and if he were a indian millionaire he would actually contribute like he he would donate to something called an atheist mission so in a sarcastic manner or like in, in, he uses sarcasm and says that if i were a millionaire i would just indian millionaire um i would help out the atheist mission because he thinks that religion is like the main problem of india which is driving people down and making them waste their time in useless things but uh, a better sort of you know uh, atheistic or uh, the culture of unbelief um, that he is more used to back home he, he thinks is more helpful so he he say um, so he's actually contrasting the religious culture of his con- uh, his own nation to that of indians he says as long as the hindus and muslims are uh, taking religion so seriously now the, um, any kind of progress is not um, possible so here we see 
a discourse of progress working here of how progress um, uh, progress is equated to um, how well um, indians actually accept a new sort of way of thinking about life and we leave behind the religious uh, mindset so here uh, he says that um, as um, progress won't have take place until and unless hindus and muslims are as deeply enthusiastic about religion as we are as in we he he means um, um, english the english we are uh, we are about the church of england so here here is a like a sarcastic comment here which uh, which actually speaks about how people in england no longer take the church of england that seriously it it is it just serves as like a um, uh, uh, like an honorary sort of uh, um, so not so significant part of um, english life but here he sees like you know people take religion so seriously all around him he sees this religious culture and in the, all this excess hits him and his uh, his opinion or like his comment upon all of this is that people need to move away from religion in order to progress in life that is his solution